Okay, so now we are live on YouTube, on Facebook, and I'm really happy this time, not during the week, but on a Sunday, uh, to have uh, my new friend, Mayur, from India, as my guest. I have to be honest, I only know you through social media, uh, especially through Instagram and your activities. Also, I'm following your activities on YouTube, and uh, you're doing a lot of things that I put also in... Uh, as information on on the advertisement of the of this live interview so maybe let's start and you introduce yourself so i i'm i'm uh, keen to know what people from from the other side <laughs> you're basically india is uh, not so far away but what uh, this huge country is all about uh, especially when we talk about dental photography so i want to jump right into the discussion and ask you when did you find out that you have this passion that we see on your on your social media and different activities on not only dental but general photography mayor right so let me just confirm if I'm audible. Uh, you can hear me clearly. Yes. Great. Okay. So it was uh, 2009. I had tried for getting into post graduation, but I never got into post graduation because I was not a great student, perhaps. Uh, so I started off with my own private practice, and uh, uh, I knew it that if I want to do, if I want to become a good clinician, it is important for me to document cases nicely because. When I document cases nicely and accurately, uh, my mentors will be able to see my mistakes more clearly. So that is exactly how I got into dental photography. Uh, it took me two years to buy my first camera because I did not have money enough to buy a DSLR at that time. Um, but later on, I started pursuing it more seriously. So after I got my DSLR, I did dental photography with an 1855 lens for almost two years. But during the same time, I also uh, got into wildlife photography. So I pursued uh, photography of butterflies, like recording the butterfly life, cy life cycles of the butterflies. Then I got into birds. I also did a course on ornithology in order to understand the birds better. I did a course on botany. So I was going pretty much into the wildlife aspect of photography. Um, later on, I realized that it's, it's not very ethical to actually grab hold of a frog or a snake reposition it and take a picture of it because uh, the entire we are disturbing them by holding it holding the snakes and frogs on our side so i left um, that completely because it was not ethical um, also when i'm not sure if you know but a lot of bird photographers give out bird calls so they will play the call of the bird in their phone and then after they hear that the bird comes and the bird, you get to picture of you get to take a picture of the bird all these things are very unethical and i found that ethics is really important for me so that's that's when the time was for me to shift back into my own studio and then i started off with uh, high speed macro photography which i do as liquid splashes so i love shooting the li liquid splashes because <laughs> it's really amazing love to play with the liquids and go crazy with the colors and shapes so i got deeper into that and then I got an opportunity to exhibit at some of the finest art galleries of the country. You might not be knowing, but there are art gallery, there are art galleries like the Jahangir Art Gallery, which are very prestigious. Uh, so which have a waiting period of close to five years to exhibit over there. So I exhibited over there. Then I got on the cover shot of the biggest photography magazine of the country, which is called as the Better Photography Magazine. And I became the judge of, um, you must be knowing about this competition called as the Photo Marathon. It's really famous. <laughs> uh, so I, I became the judge of that and then uh, I realized that I had achieved quite a bit in general photography. It is at that time that I felt that I should share my experiences with my colleagues and uh, probably teach them uh, photography in dentistry because I had already reached a stage where I could, I had experienced a lot. So I learned everything on my own by failing a lot of times. That's why I have the answers to almost everything that a beginner in dental photography or general photography might have. So I'm, I'm really confident in answering all those queries. That's how I decided that I want to teach dental photography. But when I started teaching in 2013, not a lot of people were really interested. So a lot of my effort has gone into creating awareness that, bro, dental photography is very important and you need to follow dental photography seriously. So that's how my journey started in dental and general photography. 
Yeah, it's interesting what you, what you're saying that you that you went over also to taking pictures of animals and flowers and other things. So uh, b my experience is also if if you if you get into the passion for photography, then you want to do also something different than what what uh, what leads me to the next question: the role of dental photography. And you stated it right in your introduction. You have to document cases it's standardized so the photography we are doing every day is looking from outside to what we see in our patients looking from inside is the x-ray so both the x-ray and the photography are the two imaging tools uh, that we have and photography mm -hmm. scanning is the 3d version of photography and cone beam CT is the 3D version of, of X-ray. So these are the two, the, the two tools we basically have as a dentist. But if you're honest, dental photography and being standardized photography is not really sexy. You know, <laughs> it's, it's something <laughs> that, you, that you need to, to be able to handle. So for me, for, uh, I'm doing dental photography for, for many, many, many years, teaching also like you are doing. But for me, it's important to tell the dentist, look, it's important to set up your camera correctly and to shoot every day with the same settings, standardized. And at the end, you might feel a little bit, oh, this is boring, taking, taking my camera and just pu pushing the button and it's always the same. And it's, it's always the same and it has to be always the same. It's like doing a filling. Maybe yeah. the, the, it's a different tooth, different tooth that you're treating, but basically you're following the same protocols and this is important. And this is what my message also to uh, all dental photographers out there is that it's important that you follow guidelines, that you follow standards. And, and, then, and then when you feel that you have a passion for photography, then I think you can go out and mm -hmm. enlarge and enlarge your equipment. So you were talking about equipment. So what was your first? Uh, what, what was your first camera? So when I started, I started in the analog days, and wow. uh, back in 1999, I bought my first DSLR, the Nikon D1. Nobody knows. Nobody knew <laughs> how to how to work with this uh, huge tool. Uh, they were just saying me, yeah, it's the same as analog. So just uh, push the same buttons, do the same settings, but it was completely different. And it took, it took me and I think also the industry many years to get to the standard we had in analog photography. So I think for, for the last 10 years, so in the last 10 years, we have reached the same levels we had uh, we had in analog photography so that's what that was about the time when you started so what's what was your first camera or your first equipment you used so i bought my first camera uh, in 2010 <clears throat> i started off with canon 600d i've never gone into analog photography but yeah i do agree that digital is slowly reaching the stage of analog but analog is still and always be the gold standard of any form of photography, be it jungle or dental photography, analog will still be the best. Just like IOPA is the gold standard. So I started with Canon 600D and I did dental photography. You won't believe this, but I did dental photography with 1855 lens for a period of two years. Okay. <laughs> Although wrong. So now now I teach my students the same thing. It's 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 a great lens for general photography. But uh, for dental photography, it's really important to have a macro lens for so many reasons. Magnification ratio and standardizing the distance with respect to the patient is, is one of the most important things. So if you want consistency, do not make the mistake that I have already made that is using the 1855 lens. So always give an example. So I have made that mistake you shouldn't make that mistake. So that's what I keep on telling my students. And I completely agree with another thing that you just said. So for, if you just keep the camera in your clinic, it does get boring over a period of time because you have to stick to the protocols and it does get pretty boring because it's monotonous. So you need to add a spark once in a while whenever you're doing dental photography. So maybe you can add studio glamour photography or maybe um, general photography. In fact, if you see the way 
I used to conduct my courses the way my courses have, have evolved over a period of time. When I launched my course first in 2013, it was a three weeks course every Sunday. So this Sunday, the next Sunday, and the next Sunday after that, because I used to teach first day, then I used to give them a week so that they can practice whatever I've covered and they can come back with their questions on the next Sunday. But this, this module is very difficult for uh, the students or the people who want to attend, because if people want to come from abroad, they cannot do that. Then I switched over to a three day program. Then people said it's three days is too long. So I, I condensed it to two days. But I did two days for a very long time. That's when I realized that what, what you just said, when they keep on doing tail photography, it becomes extremely boring and they kind of leave the camera somewhere in between. That's why I went back to the three day module. And now I have made it a point to include general photography, studio photography, and in fact, even drones in my uh, course, just to keep it a little bit more interesting. So um, a lot of my students have purchased a DJI Mavic Air and they do drone videography much better than I do. So it's it's really important to keep that flame alive, but to keep that dental photography flame, flame alive, we have to do something else like general or studio glamour photography. Exactly, I completely agree with what you have to say about that. Uh, cool, so for me important that everybody who is teaching dental photography uh, tries to follow the standards and uh, i repeat we had we we published a lot of articles together with my friends we did uh, last year a special issue in the german quintessence on on dental photography and i'm really emphasizing all the time um, as a reference i always cite the article from wolfgang bengel mm -hmm. from 1985 mm -hmm. where this is this is basically one of the only article that really describes standards in dental standards. photography. And mm -hmm. at that time it was with analog cameras, but the standards mm -hmm. established and published there think are still relevant today. And what I see, I the know. only group of dentists following in kind of standards are orthodontists. I think mm -hmm. you agree with that because they are the only ones that get paid for taking pictures. <laughs> 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 and um, a lot a lot of us they, we do we do pictures for for our personal documentation for the communication with the patient for our lectures also for for fun or for whatever reasons and but the orthodontists are forced to do that photography because it's part of the treatment protocol so um there you see kind of a standard but there are so many standards around and my goal over the last years and also for the future is that, that that we really bring more dentists back back to to standardized photography on one mm -hmm. hand and saying look this is an important part in your office it's like you don't take x-rays from five different angles mm -hmm. the bite wings are always in the same position so, so keep so keep true. this keep this and and uh, I want to push this message again. Totally. X-rays and photography are the basic tools we need for, for visualizing our patients and both need standards. And in photography, what I saw over the last years, we have lost a little bit the standards and I see more and more artistic photography yeah. also in the submission of articles for the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry. A lot of people is they shoot the initial picture with a smartphone and then oh. the final picture is done with studio lights and whatever. <laughs> but this is not really fair. This is not really fair and it's you can do that. So uh, you see these offices with, with studio lights integrated in the treatment room. It's fun, mm -hmm. it's nice, but then you need to do the whole documentation with this. And in addition, you need to shoot pictures with a standard photography equipment. So without bouncers, so with the real light, so that we see what the patient sees and what reality really looks like. And uh, I always tell people, mm -hmm. you don't need Photoshop. You just need to know, you need to know how to manipulate the light and then mm -hmm. everything looks nice. So you agree on that? I couldn't agree more. In fact, I have the same principles. So 
typically in in my programs i always stress on five different types of standardizations that every student has to follow and that is a rule we all have to follow it first one is standardization of equipment so the first thing that i tell all of my students is just because you you got a new camera or a new flash and you started off a case with an inbuilt flash but now you got a twin flash does not mean that you take the post operative picture with a twin flash just because you bought it you have to continue the entire case with the same equipment so i couldn't have agreed more and we are standardization of protocols in the sense how many pictures we are taking for a particular picture so we have an acd protocol we have ucla protocol so we need to decide first what protocol are we going 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 with so if it's an aesthetic protocol <clears throat> i believe you are going to be lecturing in iwacd this just the coming week so if we are if we are into aesthetics we are going to be following 12 images there's no question about that then we have protocol for orthodontists in which they take five pictures so it's it's really important to begin with the end product in mind as to what are we going to do is it more functional is it more aesthetic if it's aesthetic then 12 pictures if it's functional then 16 pictures or the ucla protocol ds dsd has its own protocol so start off with the end product in mind and then start off with the cases so everything is so important the standardization of settings like you said with your reference with wolf can be in 1985 he stressed a lot on the equipment, uh, sorry, the setting standardization. That's so important. You cannot keep on playing with the settings once it's ISO 100, once it's ISO 400. It's just going to look horrible. So, and even the colors I've seen, especially, uh, I mean, I don't want to take any names, but in my country, a lot of clinicians do great work. But if you see their pictures, one of the pre operative picture is very much yellow, the post operative picture is really red. And it's really disturbing. And how, how do you compare pictures like these? So if you're showing me post operative, which has a red color cast, and you expect me to compare it with a picture which has a yellow color cast or a red color cast or even a green color cast, how, do, how, do, how does the audience understand what is good work? So it's so important to keep the settings constant. So I always tell my students, camera has to be on manual mode, the lens has to be on manual mode, and even the flash has to be on manual mode. So that's so important. And then we come out with standardization of magnification ratios. That's And I have something called the rule of five, which is really interesting. So I always share that with uh, a lot of my students. And I always tell them that um, if you are doing photography for publicity, you can go out with studio lights. But if it's for publication and for journals, you have to stick to ring flash or a twin flash without bouncers. So, you have to differentiate before you start off with a case. Is it is it a publicity thing that you're going to be putting it on Instagram or is it for publication? That's how you decide what is the light source that you're going to be using in your photography. So couldn't couldn't agree more with what you're saying, especially because studio lights masks the mistakes that a dentist could have done. For example, I, I would probably use a studio light when I feel, okay, I've not done a great job, but I still want the case to look sexy. <laughs> so I would probably use studio light in a way to mask that mistake because I know just by changing an angle, I can mask that mistake. Uh, so you, there cannot be a blanket rule that uh, you can use studio light in all the cases. In fact, the people who use studio lights, I would tell them, if you really want to show the quality of your work, don't use studio lights, use a ring flash or a twin flash because they are the ones who are actually going to educate the masses and actually show where the mistakes are whereas the studio lights is exactly opposite it, even if somebody has made a mistake nobody's going to be able to see that so wouldn't have agreed more with uh, what you're saying the trend is a little scary a lot of people are doing studio lights but i would probably always tell them that stick to the basics first part of the protocols and only just for fun studio lights not otherwise yeah but um, what i see is uh, a lot of cultural differences when we talk about photography, uh, you see you see the South American style, North American style, European style, Asian style, Russian style, Japanese style. So um, there's a, a large variety. So artistic artistic photography seems related also to the gotcha. to the mentality of people. So the South Americans uh, more being. Uh, the, the no, without being negative the more the party people we are more mm -hmm. we are in europe we are more the the, the strict people okay. so so uh, uh, artistic photography is less important or less uh, less trendy in 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 my surroundings so i'm i'm in switzerland 
so aesthetic or artistic uh, photography my colleagues they tell me i don't have time or i don't want i don't want to waste time to uh, do uh, artistic photo shootings with my with my patients and in some countries this is more important but also in the communication with the patients so also the patients want to see themselves in different lights so if i would ask my patient to do a photo shooting when my work is finished and i get a hairstyler and uh, and uh, and the makeup artist they will tell me what do you want <laughs> you know? You know, and in other countries, this is really popular, and uh, right. the patient wants the pa even the patient wants to be like uh, uh, a show, uh, and and so this is this. There are different there are different styles in different countries, but coming back, this is something that is an in individual thing, and it's different in different countries in different cultures, but. The standards on how we should document cases. This is something that should be globally the same. Sure, I think this sure. uh, this is uh, also summarizing what what you stated. So one side question: Did you ever try to use uh, your smartphone to take dental photography? Uh, there are a lot of people switching over to mobile dental photography. I don't find it uh, encouraging to use it. I do not try it, but if somebody wants to learn, at least I can show them what all they can do better with it. I do not recommend it, but if, if somebody has no money or somebody is hell-bent that they want to use a phone, I can just say that, okay, if you, if you are hell-bent to just use a phone, might as well use it at some decent settings, but I've never used it in my clinic, uh, my practice, not even planning to. So I have eight cameras uh, in my clinic. <laughs> I would rather I would rather use one of them, but um, there's something that I definitely and even more so now in COVID era. Uh, so in in my clinical practice, uh, in my operatory, phones are not allowed. It does not matter if it's me as a dentist or my patient. All the phones have to be uh, uh, left in the reception area where they are locked in a locker, and nobody gets to get the phone inside the operatory, especially nowadays. So there's no question of getting the phone in the operatory at the first place now. So that's that's what I believe in. I strictly believe in DSLR only obviously because of many reasons. One is distortion, that is obvious. Second is depth of field, the shallow in mobile phones. And the third thing is, uh, what are they going to do with the F number? F number does not change in the phones. And how are they going to maintain magnification ratios? They need to answer that. Uh, so I do not uh, go too much into it. So the way I teach us, I teach them what they're supposed to know uh, so whatever they want to use after that is completely their choice. But personally, I am not going to use a phone ever in my practice. That's for sure. I've never used it before. I don't even plan to use it now. Yeah, I think I think smartphone have replaced cameras in almost all situations. So if you look at the market uh, in 2010, uh, 120 million cameras have been sold and uh, last year it was less than 20 million so there was a dramatic drop so cameras or the cameras we use for dental photography are like niche products and the smartphone has taken over the thing but macro photography what dental photography is macro photography needs needs some equipment that so far from my point of view is not built in in uh, in the smartphones and there are some some uh, people I know, like Luis Ardan, and who 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 uh, wrote a book about smart, uh, mobile photography. They're like artists in uh, using this camera. But I think uh, if you really want standardized photography, you 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 should stick to a to a DSLR, a mirrorless camera with a macro lens, with the light. And and that's that's for for many years to come. I think the still still the future of dental photography. Mm -hmm. There is one thing that I want to stop and explain over here. Even in even in the promotions, I want the audience to understand. Look at the kind of pictures they are promoting mobile dental photography with. It's more of glamour, and that gets back to our previous uh, argument. Not an argument. It's a healthy discussion. So that is more of glamour photography. 
are we going to document our cases with glamour photography is what you need to ask before you touch that phone so it's really important to understand that when they are promoting glamour they know what they are promoting and they are not promoting standardization so if you want to do standardization it is important to stick to uh, magnification ratios how 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 are you going to get magnification ratios on the phone we need to ask that so maybe the audience should take a call if uh, they want to be strict with documentation and protocols or if they just want to do it comfortably that's that's a very subjective choice but if somebody wants to be serious because they are great clinicians i do not think they should take this thing for granted and switch over to mobile phones yeah. because so if they are good I clinicians don't... they have to stick to yeah. um, top protocols I just want to show a, a short thing. So one of your amazing pictures that are artistic is artistic photography. Uh, I really like that. Compared to uh, let's say everyday photography, we are we are doing in our office. So these are two different things. And um, maybe maybe you uh, you can explain or you you uh, you told me before when we started our discussion that you want to show some of your work. Maybe sure. it's interesting if you can share your screen and yeah. show us uh, two, three things you are doing. So I'm, I'm also curious to see. Let's check it out. <clears throat> so I just wanted to uh, confirm once. Uh, are you able to see my screen now? Yes. All right. So let me begin with um, the cover shot. So this is what I love to pursue. Uh, can you see the picture on the screen right now? Yes. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a cover shot of the magazine where I had. Um, uh, so this was the cover shot of the magazine that I was talking about. That's better photography. This is India's biggest photography magazine. They had interviewed me for this. Uh, so I specialize in liquid droplets and I love to do it. It's it's a very difficult job, but uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It gives you a lot of satisfaction. Apart from that, I just wanted to show a couple of uh, general pictures for uh, the audience. So I love to record life cycles of the butterflies. I've done a lot of bird photography. Uh, I love doing wide angle photography when I go to different, different places. So all of these have been reduced to um, a Facebook kind of uh, a resolution so that it does not look bad when we upload it. Uh, but uh, I love to do, uh, so this picture is with an 1855 lens. I've taken this picture with an 1855 lens because at that time I did not have a macro lens, but it, it looks great. But um, it's good to have all that when uh, we are not looking forward for protocols, but when we want protocols, um, magnification ratio is so important. Rain flash is important. I love the catch lights and these. I love spiders. <laughs> yes. I love spiders a lot. And uh, nowadays I do a lot of um, super macro photography. I got a lens for this. Uh, I'm sure you must be knowing about MPE 65 by Canon. Yes. Yeah, so I just got one recently and I love to use it. Recently, I've been to Assam. Uh, so I have uh, a very close friend over there, Dr. Gola, uh, who showed me rhinos for the first time. So photography is going to not only build interest in photography, but it's going to show you a lot of nature, a lot of surroundings. Photography can take you places and you can do a lot of street photography. Uh, you will travel a lot if you're really serious about photography. So it's a, it's a lot of fun, basically. So that's, that's, that's what I wanted to show. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. And, and, and again, I think if, you're, if you are a motivated dental photographer, sooner or later you will get additional equipment and take your camera home or outside. And I know a lot of dentists who are passionate photographers, not only in the dental office, but also outside mm -hmm. and taking amazing pictures. So uh, I have a friend who, uh, Cenk, um, from, from Istanbul, he's an mm -hmm. orthodontist and he's a he's world champion in underwater photography. Wow. So uh, <laughs> he sent me he sent me some pictures that we would publish in the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry, where we have in between the articles, when when there's an empty page, we have filler images. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm looking at your pictures, I would uh, I would like to invite you to to uh, to send us uh, to send us some of your artwork. That would be great. 
to be published in the, in the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry. So I'm really, I would be happy, I would be happy to have you there as well. Absolutely. There's one more thing. In fact, I, I'm not sure if you know about this, but we come up with a dental photography calendar every year. There's a competition that happens. Uh, are you aware of that? No. Okay, so we have a competition called a four dental photography calendar, which happens every year. So we have people participating from across the globe and we select 13 best pictures that get printed on our calendar and people can go ahead and check it out, buy them. But um, we did not come up with one last year because I was really squeezed with time, but it's something that I'm looking forward to this year. So uh, if, if people are interested in uh, photography, dental photography, so in dental photography calendar, only dental photography pictures would be there. But if people are interested, this is also one way pursuing dental photography as an art form. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, I just want to show you show you one thing. Um, I share. I quickly share my share my screen with you. So, so if you allow me. <laughs> yeah, sure. So it's uh, the this one. The voila. So I will uh, go to the website. Was like like blocked. Okay, so we have. So la last last year I I uh, did my first dental photography conference and we we had planned to do the second one this year, but you know, <laughs> uh, the world mm -hmm. the world turned upside down, and so we are not we are not able to do this. And so that's why uh, I started building, building this website. And what we are now doing is we, we are using new tools. We are using new tools to communicate, to communicate with, uh, with, with, our, with our colleagues uh, using virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we are doing a lot of virtual reality trainings and, uh, and uh, what, what, because when you talk, when you started talking about uh, the competition on our website, we have a virtual gallery, mm -hmm. and uh, and and we could do we could do an exposition there in our virtual gallery if you're interested in. So this gallery is uh, is ready for all members of our community. So membership is uh, really a, a, a cheap at a cheap level. You get a lot of information and. I just want to show you. I want to show you uh, the the short teaser that I showed you yesterday. In our learning module, we learn how to set up the focus of the camera. We use the entire screen as the viewfinder, so you can explore all the options. Look around. We have a cold mountain environment where the objective is to capture three pictures of three animals. Each animal is placed at a different distance so you need to change your focus and aperture on each shot. To begin, click on the camera on the table and you will see what the camera sees. You will see a circle which indicates where each animal is located. Once you find the animal, the circle turns green indicating that you are on the target. Then, you can adjust the values on the Nikon Z7 in order to get the best picture. Go ahead. Try it out. So basically, this is a small teaser on what we are also working for is uh, really a, an, an app to learn not only dental photography, we'll start with something that covers the basics of photography. And then we'll add we will add some modules and one module will be dental photography. And I think this will change also the way you we are able to educate people around the globe to get more standardized education. This will not replace practical training. But I think we can start at a much higher level 
if we if we teach the basics through this virtual reality or like gamification of training we call that the gamification of training exactly. so then people learn much easier the basics and then it's like if you if you go to on the racetrack with the car so if you're an experienced driver it's more fun if you're if you're just a, a, a new a new a new driver it's not fun you're you're more afraid of not enough of not destroying the car and i think it's the same with photography if we can gather people at a higher level then it's also more fun for us teachers to get to explore more details to get more and uh, more more discussion with the audience i don't know what what are your thoughts about new technologies to be integrated in in our daily teaching i totally agree with that because e-learning is going to be the next big thing it is not going to be it is the next big thing especially considering the social distancing norms i couldn't have agreed more with you uh, we need more and more things like this there's no doubt about that okay cool so um i i have to check if there's any questions so people are just uh, giving giving us their hands <laughs> that's nice <laughs> that's nice to hear so i i hope that everybody enjoyed enjoyed this uh, live chat i enjoyed it very much and i'm sure that we will stay in touch uh, so i i i really i will send you an email asking you if you can provide me with some of your great pictures to be published in the international you journal of the industry that would be that would be really great and um, i i just want to advertise a little bit also our projects um, you can uh, I, I i i have entered also the e the url of your youtube channel and your uh, your photography site so you have also a lot of information to offer so dentist.camera is the website is the instagram account is almost everything there and i'm looking forward to get in touch with as many friends around the globe because i think it's about exchanging our ideas and learning from each other because uh, you never stop learning so I'm looking forward and next week I will be happy to talk to this um, Indian dental group and mm -hmm. there my, my topic of my lecture will be on virtual reality and how we can benefit using this technology not only in photography but in dentistry and in other fields as well so Mayur thank you very yes. much for taking your time and okay. stay healthy stay safe and yeah Let's talk to you soon. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me over. It was an absolute pleasure to connect with like-minded people. Uh, it was it was a beautiful conversation. It was nice to know your thought process that we both think in the same lines of maintaining protocols as the gold standard of dental photography. I'll, I'll connect with you soon. And you don't have to ask me if I have to send it. No formalities required. I'll be sending you across all my pictures without you even asking me. I'd be more than happy to be making it a part of your journey. It's, it's, it's cool. It's, it's my honor. Super. See so you. have a great Sunday and see you soon. Yeah. See you.